Hey, blogging heads, it's Spencer Ackerman from Wired's Danger Room and the Attackerman blog, here with my friend Rob Farley of the University of Kentucky, uh, and the excellent blogs Lawyers, Guns and Money, and Information Dissemination. How's it going, Rob? Just fine. How are you doing? Eh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Been better, been worse. That's how that goes. Yeah. Um, so, been better, been worse, but maybe not been less exciting. This is 2011. Um, I mean, really, the only thing that I can think could cap off this year would be a Yankees-Reds World Series. Um, I mean, maybe it's a little fast out of the gate, but this has been a very exciting year so far. If we could make it that far, <laughs> in, in show, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about Bartolo Colon as our long man. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. So, uh, so there's this thing that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah, so we've got um, this other war. Um, right. As, as a, you know, one of the things I, I want to... You know, talk, get your get your perspective on, um, you know, given your your enthusiasm for all things navy and all things strategy, mm -hmm. uh, is the way in which we're seeing sort of uh, recently discredited, I would have thought, arguments about air power coming to resurface at least mm -hmm. implicitly with the way the administration has been discussing Libya. Um, the uh, the gap between the established ends of 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 of, uh, of this war campaign, which is to say civilian protection, the grounding of Gaddafi's aircraft, and the broader aims of U.S. policy, which is to say the end of the Gaddafi regime, mm -hmm. don't formally meet up, as far as I can tell, except through the implicit presumption that the more we pound this guy's uh, ground forces, his command and control apparatus, and right. whatever other elements of the, of the regime uh, exist to be pounded, uh, it's just going to collapse. And, you know, we've seen that several times throughout history, repeatedly, repeatedly disproven. Uh, so I wanted to get your take on whether you think that's that's what's at work here or right. if there's something more, more sensible than I'm seeing. Right. Well, I'm sure you saw um, in the weeks before the intervention, or um, let, let's not call it an intervention, it's a war. When you bomb yes. people, it's a war. Um, so before the war was started, um, or at least our part of the war was started, you did start seeing some of the air power people um, sort of creep out of the um, cracks and start talking about how wonderful it would be and how easy it would be for air power to make things happen in Libya. Um, and you do kind of have to wonder how much that found its way up into the upper levels of the administration. Although, you know, I mean, it's interesting that a lot of the rhetoric we normally see associated with air power, and I mean, especially the phrase, the phrase that I'm, I'm thinking about is effects-based operations, right. um, which isn't just an air power thing, but it, it, it's mostly thought about in terms of air power. Um, and, of course, the phrase shock and awe, which, uh, you know, appears to have been wholly discredited by the Iraq War and by the 2006 uh, war against Hezbollah. Um, uh, you're not really seeing a lot of that kind of rhetoric um, right now about the air power campaign. You kind of have to infer that there is this belief that attacking Gaddafi with air power will, or that you have to infer that they believe that attacking Gaddafi with air power will make him go away. But there hasn't been the same kind of explicit link that, I mean, you and I have heard in all of these previous wars where air power is this thing that's going to deliver these marvelous victories for um, pennies on the dollar and so forth and whatnot. So forth and, whatnot. Um, and you, you also now haven't necessarily seen it in terms of the target selection. Um, the target selection is that's right. seems to me to be very conservative so far. I mean, there are some there is some attacks on their command and control, and there's some attacks on Tripoli and so forth. But a lot of this is you know hitting the air defense network, uh, and then uh, just really hitting the ground forces and 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 blasting the bejesus out of tanks is you know something that air force people do for fun, but it's not really the their main way of thinking about the utility of air power. I mean that's kind of a waste of ordnance to the really serious air power fanatics. Um, and yet that's what they're doing right here. And it's, so it's kind of interesting that at least the rhetoric of air power seems to have been toned down, even if you can still infer that there must be this belief that air power is going to deliver victory. Well, we've got, you know, two choices on that front. I think, mm -hmm. as you summed it up, well, either we infer that that's the belief or we have to conclude that there isn't much <laughs> of a sense of, of, of what's supposed to connect uh, this campaign to, to the stated aims of U.S. policy, being the end of Gaddafi. Um, it's funny that you mentioned um, this lack of, of air power uh, triumphalism. Um, I've done a couple pieces over the last few weeks in which I've, I've talked to veterans of, of previous no-flight campaigns um, from both a headquarters level and, and, and a tactical level, and all of them 
have been remarkably circumspect about what what air power can achieve. You know, from its from its tactical application, uh, you know, we can do quite much as mu as long as we can find stuff to bomb, stuff to strafe. We can do that really well, and I think you've you've, you've seen that in the campaign. Um, the fact that you know, there's there's basically no radar emissions mm -hmm. uh, from from any of, of of the of the Gaddafi air defense uh, installations. Uh, I think it was basically yesterday that we saw uh, an actual instance of, of one of Gaddafi's planes launching and, and the French shooting it down. You know, after you know a week of this thing happening. Is, is well, we, we, we should we should clarify there. The, the the French plane forced it down and then blew it up with a missile after it had landed. Uh, I don't want okay. to take anything away from the French, but uh, you know, that's what happened. Okay, we didn't, we didn't actually see air-to-air -air combat. <laughs> okay, um, and thanks for the correction on that. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, you've seen that on the tactical level, but, but you know, at least the people I've been talking to uh, really just go back to the question of, of what the actual strategy is and where the air campaign can, can perhaps bring that down, even before you get to uh, a, a, a statement of commitment about the efficacy of air power, about about many of the theories behind it, uh, and then grappling with some of the, the complications that we've seen over the years, um, it you know what you know should we be you know looking to uh, at this point? It's been it's been you know uh, interesting to me that at least from the the, the perspective of, of the operational command of the mm -hmm. war, um, we've we've had a you know a, a navy admiral in charge of it. Um, there's been you know quite a tremendous amount of, of uh, of, of, of Tomahawk missiles launched. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one, one really amazing thing about uh, what we haven't seen uh, in the Mediterranean is a U.S. aircraft carrier. Right. Um, right. You know, I, I, usually, you know, you would, you know, you think you get the Navy involved in this sort of thing, you want to really get the Navy involved in it. Um, and I think your, your co-blogger, Galrin, made the, the point earlier today, we also haven't seen, you know, the littoral combat ship. When there's right. so much of Libya that's basically along the coastline in terms of, 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 of strategic targets. So what are we really needing this campaign up to? Right. I mean, that's a fantastic. I mean, not only don't we have an American carrier, but I mean, the Charles de Gaulle didn't leave port until two days after the operation. Um, that's the French aircraft carrier. It didn't leave port until two days after the operation started. Um, and then, I, I mean, I think it's been flying sorties since then. And of course, the British don't have an aircraft carrier. I don't think the Italian aircraft carrier has been doing anything. Um, yeah, we've just seen the Garibaldi kind of just floating, and uh, right. you know, what, what in the world have they launched? Right, right. Um, now the, I mean, the Kearsarge has been flying Harriers, um, and they've been flying. Yeah. I think they've been flying close, close, um, close support operations. Um, so uh, uh, ground support operations, because I mean that's what Harriers are good at. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. I mean, and the Enterprise is right there in the Red Sea, if I recollect, is it, if it's still there. And so it's interesting that the Enterprise isn't being deployed yeah. in service. But maybe that's a way of the administration. I mean, uh, uh, let me run this past you. Maybe is this a way of the administration? trying to send a clear signal to the French and the British. And I, and I think that this is really a British and French operation. I mean, there are a bunch of other European allies, but it seems like the British and French are, are, are really the prime drivers. Um, is not flying a carrier a way of indicating to them that this is not the United States' fight, that, that, that our commitment to this is limited, despite what we may be um, sending so far? Or I don't know. What yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, that strikes me as plausible. You know, they, you know remember... Gates ordered the Kearsarge and the Ponce uh, to go to the Mediterranean in, in, in the earliest instance of, the, of NATO perhaps getting involved back when this, this was an evacuation mission um, and, and to, to a lesser degree a humanitarian aid mission. Um, with the French and British taking such a, you know, gung-ho lead from the start uh, rhetorically and, and pushing it at the United Nations, it would, you know, stand to reason that, you know, you, you don't really need to recall the Eisenhower uh, from from the Red Sea uh, and put it back in the Med or you know move some other so they care. I'm not honestly sure what you know anything would be closer than the Eisenhower. Um, uh, a couple, I, I guess, uh, two days ago, a couple, you know, a bunch of reporters had had, uh, had breakfast with, with Admiral Roughhead, um, the the chief of Navy operations, and you know he made the point of just saying, you know. We've got other naval elements uh, in in the region, and um, you know, from from coalition partners. And at the same time, uh, you know, it's not like the navy in the Middle East is you know somehow taking some time off. 
you know, between counter piracy and, and, and you know, waiting for uh, other revolutions in, in the region to, to explode, you've got, you've got a rather taxed uh, navy in, around the Middle East and in the, the northern Indian Ocean. So, you know, you, you've got these other commitments and you've got uh, other nations uh, aligned with NATO or in NATO uh, who are willing to take up that burden. It just, you know, surprised me that, you know, the chief of naval operations wasn't like, goddamn right, I'm sending the eyes and that works for the Met. Right, right, because there's usually, I mean, there's usually that kind of bureaucratic well, I want, I want the Met, obviously he's not empowered right. to actually do that. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it's interesting, too. I, is this the first time that one of the, um, so the USS Florida used to be an Ohio-class ballistic missile submarine, and now it's an Ohio-class cruise missile submarine. Yes. Um, and it was one of the foremost, um, uh, it was part of the initiation of the attacks, or part of and the very this, first part of the top This was attacks. indeed its, its maiden combat fleet. Right. Right, and, and I, it's the first one of those. I mean, there are four converted to cruise missiles, and it's the first one of those to be fighting. Is that correct? Am I right? That is, that is correct, yes. All right. And so, I mean, that's when I mean, there might be some sort of institutional um, thing going on with that in terms of demonstrating the effect. I mean, you could use other ships than the Florida, but the Florida is really good at this kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting from a bureaucratic point of view that the Navy hasn't been... Um, hasn't been more aggressive in terms, and I, and I, I guess I have, I guess I have to go back to thinking that it is that that the, the administration is thinking about aircraft car carriers in terms of their political impact, um, and is thinking about how every camera would be on. Is it the Eisenhower or is it the Enterprise that's in the Red Sea? I thought it was it's the Enterprise. The Enterprise. It's yeah. the Enterprise. Did, did I say Eisenhower? That's my fault. Yeah, you said Eisenhower, and this would actually also be the Enterprise's last hurrah. So this is already yeah. effectively the Enterprise's, and so this would be. Um, there's sort of every reason to think that the Enterprise would be involved in this, and yet it's not. Um, and so I guess I have to think that's some yeah. kind of political decision. Uh, interesting, interesting, interesting trivia about that. Do you know what the what the uh, the Enterprise's first mission was? Uh, was it to? Oh, no, it's not. It was the. It, hmm? Go ahead. It was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, you see, there we go. No, I was thinking. I mean, the Enterprise. Old, old shit. Yeah. Right. The Enterprise is um, so one of its most famous missions was when it deployed in the um, in the Indo-Pakistani War um, and was deployed to tell the Indians to back off and they completely ignored the presence of the Enterprise. But that kind of shows you sort of how these things are politically notable. Um, yeah, and, you know, and you're, you're right. You know, if we if we if we send an aircraft carrier, it is a signal of Americanization at a time when not only the administration not want to do that, but you've got a navy that's got to worry about. You know, quite a great deal that, that it's also doing, um, both in the region and, and of course, in Japan. Um, you know, do you, you know, we've, we've, you know, been trying to get some kind of clarity on what uh, the handover and the transition of power is going to look like, mm -hmm. um, and we just don't have it. You know, the administration, is, as best I can determine, uh, has a desire to transition power, and it doesn't have a plan. And to some degree, the vicissitudes of its plan are, are based on, on, you know, what you can get out of NATO and what you can get out of coalition operations. Um, you know, we, we saw a press conference this afternoon, it's Friday afternoon, um, from the Pentagon that still said that, you know, it was an open question whether NATO was going to take over the ground mission, which is to say um, striking targets, you know, from the skies, Qaddafi's ground forces, um, while we've had, you know, reports for most of the day about NATO basically saying, like, we're going to take the whole thing. Um, I think it's a, a Canadian general, an Air Force general, uh, Charles Bouchard, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, who's supposed to command this overall effort. Um, so if that's, if that's, you know, happening yet, at least at, you know, this, this point in time, you know, late Friday afternoon, the Pentagon isn't, isn't quite clear on it, or at least isn't ready to brief on it. Um, you know, what do you make of the fact that, you know, we're a week into a campaign that, you know, does show signs of transitioning, but, you know, mm -hmm. you know, from what we have to God knows what. Right. I mean, I, I think it demonstrates that um, the administration would love for, um, and I think they're not the only ones, but they would love to put a NATO um, stamp on this. But there are key members of NATO, and not just Turkey. I mean, Turkey is sort of has the, the most relevant objections, but there are a lot of members of NATO that aren't excited about this at all. Um, and Italy is one of them, and Germany is one of them. And so, 
to the extent that they can sell this to NATO, they can sell a no-fly zone, and that's awesome because right. no Libyan planes are going to take off between now and forever. Um, but they're having a lot more trouble selling the ground attacks. And, uh, you know, it, it, as I was reading it today, that, that's what sort of leapt out at me, that the, what the, probably the problem is convincing some of these partners to be part of... Um, I mean, obviously, no, no NATO country has to be part of the attacks, um, but to even be part of the structure um, and part of the political um, weight behind the ground attacks. And there's just a lot of reluctance within some members of NATO. And so that's why they're still not sure who exactly is in command here. And you've seen the French take a kind of, you know, I don't, you know, when you call it cynical, I would call it, you know, fairly cynical uh, mm -hmm. position that, you know, the reason why uh, this ought not to be a NATO mission is because you can't keep the Arab League on board with that, which seems to be nonsense. Um, and the French would, would prefer simply to, you know, circumvent the NATO structure that would uh, encumber it with this, you know, more limited mission as the French, you know, seek valiantly, uh, you know, out uh essentially mission creep. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, I don't know if they'll be successful, but right now um, we, we do have a kind of bifurcated command structure where you have the U.S., the U.K., and the French who are going to be handling uh, the air attacks on, on uh, Loyalist ground forces in the mm -hmm. no-flight, which is more or less complete across the entirety of, of, of northern Libya coast to coast. Right by everyone else, which, which now looks to be, and has looked since the, you know, the weekend, basically, to be the subordinate mission, the subordinate right. campaign. No, um, I, I, think I, I think I read that the Danes have engaged in some ground attacks, too. I, I didn't read, I was told that by a Dane, that they had engaged in some ground attacks. I don't know if that's the case, but... That's um, the Anders Fogh Rasmussen of war. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess... Human. Yeah. Well, we should talk, I mean... In terms of the military situation as we see it right now, and I guess for our listeners out there, you probably read, you've probably seen quite a few of these on Libya so far. But I mean, and I think we're probably on the same page as this, and it's one of the reasons why that I, for example, just don't see how we have a connection for the ends and means here, is that it's just so difficult to imagine the Libyan rebels advancing, um, even against weak Gaddafi opposition even with the air support of, of Britain, France, and the United States, um, and taking ground and eventually taking Tripoli. I mean, that just seems so difficult to see happening right now, given the state of Libyan ground forces. And there seems to be no way to solve that problem, uh, other than, than retraining the entire Libyan rebel force um, over a course of many months and then trying to do it. I mean, it just, I guess that's what sort of gets at me in terms of this not making sense. And... You started to see this afternoon in Washington the former U.S. ambassador to Tripoli uh, float for the first time the suggestion that the U.S. is actively considering trying to lift the arms embargo imposed by the United Nations with American support uh, to, to arm the rebels at this point. Um, so there's at least some recognition that this has stalemated, that there's been some minor success in pushing uh, the, the Gaddafi forces certainly away from Benghazi, but barely back from uh, Ajdabiya and Misrata, and whatever else happens, God knows what. Um, I, and, you know, I don't really see how, you know, if you put, you know, even surface air missiles, you know, you know, man pads or whatever in the hands of people who aren't trained to use them, as it seems like the Libyan rebels aren't that could possibly make a difference. They're going to end up hurting themselves. They're going to end up killing people they don't mean to kill, and they're not going to have accurate fires against the people they need to push back. So, right. you know, at what point are you going to see, you know, the British, you know, ratchet in some SAS guys, or, you know, someone's going to funnel some money to a private security company, right. uh, which, full disclosure, is a piece I'm working on right now, um, to, to, to just, you know, get some kind of training on the ground and essentially direct uh, the campaign for the rebels. Because, you know, you know, short of that, you really do have a recipe for, for an incredibly long campaign, barring some, you know, outside, you know, decision, some external decision by, by Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unlike the, the 2000, I'm sorry, unlike the 1999 Kosovo campaign, you know, you can't say that, you know, Gaddafi has some big benefactor like Milosevic had with the Russians, who eventually say, this, this has to stop. You have to find um, some way out of this and we'll, we'll, we'll broker something 
um, with, with NATO so that uh, this, this impasse can, can be avoided. Um, that's kind of a strength of having alienated the world, wouldn't you say, from Gaddafi's <laughs> perspective? Right. Well, and, and you know, also Mil Milosevic um, in the end and, and what he did in the end is he could make a choice between trying to hold on to the regime and trying to hold on to Kosovo. Um, and it turns out in the end that he wasn't able right. to hold on to either. But th th this is not an option for right. Gaddafi. I mean, th the best you can argue is, well, here's his choice. His choice is between um, being strung up in the street or um, or uh, retiring not to Saudi Arabia, to Venezuela or somewhere. Um, that will accept I think I read. Uh, I, think, I think I, I think I read Zimbabwe. Right, some country somewhere. Yeah, I mean, well, hopefully he won't invert, invest too much in Zimbabwean currency. But um, there's a lot of gold. Right, but but it's it's the death of the regime. Right, it, it's not just giving up yeah. a province in this case, um, and so that makes it seem so much less likely to me that that Gaddafi is going to be even as flexible as Milosevic was in this case. And I think, you know, I think you're right that you're going to have to see SAS and you're going to have to see the French equivalent. And, and it's hard for me to imagine any sort of brief training mission that would make the Libyan rebels capable. I mean, I think you have to see SAS in action, directing the campaign, directing the actual tactical fight, um, directing air power and analyzing defenses and so forth to be able to defeat Gaddafi's forces. I mean, it's, it's not as if Gaddafi's forces are, are the best of the best. They're not. I mean, even the army wasn't supposed to be very good. Mm -hmm. but, um, but they are essentially on the defensive. They're going to be on the defensive now, and the rebels have to advance against that, and there's no indication that they can do that without Western support. Even and, there's also, and, and we've also got, I think, uh, two weeks bordering, you know, at least two weeks since seeing any serious regime military defection. Right. So, I mean, that, that would be another, you know, hypothetical option for, for breaking the impacts. You know, he, Gaddafi loses the confidence of the military. And, you know, there was an interesting quote. I was, I was at a um, press conference that, uh, at the Pentagon that, um, you know, General Ham, the AFRICOM commander, uh, gave on Monday remotely from Stuttgart, uh, in which he made a point of saying, you know, we do not seek as a goal of this campaign, the destruction of the Libyan military. And over the course of the past week, you've heard uh, repeatedly from the Pentagon and from Admiral Locklear in, in the Mediterranean saying, mm -hmm. uh, we've been passing on messages to the Libyan military. They know what's expected of them. They know to fall back. Uh, mm -hmm. they, you know, it, it just seems to me that, you know, reading between the lines on that, that, you know, a, 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 a sort of second best option that the U.S. military understands is that, like, the Libyan, the Libyan generals simply decide to no longer follow Gaddafi's commands, mm -hmm. figure out some way of, of cutting a separate deal, which will be easy enough, uh, with NATO, and then right. forcing Gaddafi into, into a situation of, of capitulation, which, you know, as, you know, hopeful, you know, as a scenario as you can spin out, it seems to me. All right. I mean, it, it, it strikes me as wildly optimistic. I mean, at this yeah. point, it's, but for those Libyan generals at this point, for anyone else that's part of the regime, and the regime did experience extreme defections um, towards the beginning of the unrest. I mean, they lost, what, their entire UN staff, and they lost embassies yeah. all over the world, to the extent that everybody was sitting around just wondering how long it was going to be for Gaddafi. But, I mean, I guess there are two things. The first is that the people who defect first are the ones who are most likely to defect. Um, now, there was a tipping point beyond which everybody defects, but, you know, I think that the battle lines have hardened, and I think that the people who might defect now are worried less about the deal they're going to make with NATO, and sure, NATO might make them a deal, than the deal that the rebels are going to offer, which might be the barrel of a gun, and, and that's it. Um, because, and this is sort of the other unstated um, unstated problem with the campaign, is that once the rebels get to Tripoli, they, 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 there may be a bloodbath, and, yeah. you know, a bloodbath that looks like Benghazi. I mean, we don't know who these rebels are. We don't really know who we're negotiating with. There are certainly elements of the rebels that, that seem very interested in establishment of some sort of democratic regime. Um, there are almost certainly elements of the rebels who are going to be so radicalized by the fighting who think that, therefore, they have to kill all the loyalists when they get to Tripoli. Right. Um, we have no idea of what the factions are, how they break down, right. uh, who's, whose interests uh, they're supporting, and you know who the key allies are. Um, you, you know, there's been so much commentary in in, um, in the American press that's focused on these very uh, lofty and, and, you know, refracted through the American prison, ideological 
you know, questions about, about first principles that uh, it seems like the actual circumstances of, of, of the campaign that would even make the realization of any of those principles possible uh, is, is, is just completely able. I, you know, I, if, I, if I could find a better, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm not particularly um, hostile to the idea of the responsibility to protect, mm -hmm. but I think as, you know, as a, as a, as a you know, formerly wise president said in an earlier life, uh, mm -hmm. I am opposed to dumb wars, and <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm just not seeing uh, the strategy that can bring about the, you know, the actual uh, unstated cult war, or the, the stated goals of U.S. policy, the unstated goals of a military campaign here. Right, right, and, and I mean, I, I guess I've seen from some people that, that we've already accomplished something, which is the prevention of a massacre in Benghazi, and... That that the that's implicit... so unsatisfying to me though. Like I'm sorry, well, should I, I'll, let you, I'll, well, let you, I'll let you go. Well, I mean the the implicit the implicit outcome behind that statement has to be, and therefore what we're looking for is a partition of Libya. <laughs> because there's oh, the only way to prevent a massacre in Benghazi is continued use of coalition or air power to stop Gaddafi's loyalists from massacring people in Benghazi. Yet coalition air power is not sufficient to overthrow Gaddafi. And so if your accomplishment is preventing this massacre, then basically what you've just agreed to is a, an enforced partition of Libya. Um, and that's not a goal that's been stated. That's not a goal that anyone has talked about. You know, it made sense in, in Serbia. It made sense. We wanted to impose a partition between Serbia and Kosovo. And you could even come up with reasons why that would be a good idea. But nobody's really thought about that in terms of this context here. I mean, the best and, they can come up with is the idea that it's going to be kind of like Kurdistan and Iraq or under Saddam Hussein, and the Kurds are going to have their... But even then, you had more of an idea of what you were creating was an actual national state. And you know, go, you you, you know, we, we, we kind of need to take that that point farther, which is, you know, if, if we're to say that we have a, a campaign predicated on preventing a massacre at Benghazi, you once we intervene, we have then the responsibility to pre to prevent massacres elsewhere throughout Libya, not just up until the point that Gaddafi leaves, but after he leaves. We're assuming responsibility at this point for whatever is midwifed after Gaddafi. Um, right. Whatever Libyan structure, you know, comes to play. Now you can say it's at least a minimal goal, uh, you know, to tell whatever future government, well, you can't massacre your own your own populace now, um, mm -hmm. but we're going to end up uh, on the hook for enforcing that, and that's another rather expansive commitment. Right. I mean, to, to tell you the truth, the, the place I'm most worried about is Misrata, um, because I can see Srebrenica written all over that. Um, I mean, if if if. If, if a territorial partition is, is something that people are thinking about at all even now, there's just no way that Misrata falls on the territorial partition that's that belongs to the rebels. Right. It's um, going to belong to Gaddafi. It's, it's going to belong to Gaddafi, and it's going to be, uh, it, I mean, there, I would be deeply, I, I am right now deeply concerned about the, the situation of the rebels in Misrata, because I'm not sure that they can hold on. And um, I don't see an outcome here that is good for them other than, sort of very vigorous action, which has its own problems, to just overthrow Gaddafi right now. Now, we have, we have seen from, from, a, from the air campaign's perspective, uh, when, when, when the F-15s and the F-16s and the, I guess, the Tornadoes, the Harriers, and, and, uh, and the, oh, what's the French one, the Raphael, um, attack uh, Libyan ground positions, uh, notice what they're not doing. They're not going into the cities of Misrata. They're not going into the city of, 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 uh, of Ajdabiya. They're, they're stopping at the outskirts, even though Libyan forces, I'm sorry, Gaddafi forces are inside those cities. Um, on, on, you know, and, and this is a really kind of, you know, brutal consistency here that, that you, you know, I, you, I can at least uh, sympathize with. Because, you know, when you start, you know, an aerial campaign in an urban area for a mission that's predicated on protecting civilians, you have no guarantee that you're not going to kill the very people that you're trying to protect. So all well and good. The trouble is, is now what you're doing is, as, a, as a Admiral Gordney explained at the Pentagon today and yesterday, you're trying to attack logistic lines, uh, command lines, uh, resupply lines, uh, so that those forces inside the cities have to pull back. Now, at that point, you know, we're, we're, we're still seeing, uh, you know, re reports of atrocities from, from inside the cities because of Gaddafi's forces, even though I think in Ajdabiya they've, they've, they've had to retreat somewhat. Um, you know, how are we not, you know, 
going to near a point in which you know someone maybe it'll be the French who say, well, we have to go into those cities if we're if we're going to be serious about getting Gaddafi's forces out. Um, it's it's such a sticky situation. Um, you know, we can we can bomb these these supply lines, but you know, Lord knows, you know. If, if they're able to still get stuff into the city, they can plunder the city. They can, you know, it's not going to be a couple days in which they feel like, oh well, we're we're out of food, we're out of water, we've got to, right. we've got to fall back. Right. I mean, I think it's a serious problem, and and I think it goes back to, um, I mean, we are having we are having strategic incoherence that is um, producing operational and tactical incoherence too. Um, and there's just without without a, a sort of sensible set of strategic objectives, it's very hard then to think through this campaign and, and what we should be doing on operational and tactical levels. But you know, well, you, you know, I mean, you, you did, you did a, I, I want to come. You know, let's try and knit those things together for a second. Mm -hmm. You did a wonderful post a couple of months ago in which you lamented uh, the the you know maybe you, you could put this better than I could, but you know, if, and correct me if I'm misunderstanding mm -hmm. you or misrepresenting your post, but you know. Uh, regretting that the left doesn't produce more uh, more defense theorists and more and more uh, defense thinkers, um, people who could try and meet together, you know, questions of, of of you know militarily implementing you know doctrine for the responsibility to protect. You know, at what point would you have to say, you know, from from a, a tactical level and then an operational level, uh, right. we got to go into uh, these cities and, and and bomb Gaddafi's forces or, or consider. Um, putting some kind of ground support in, uh, or at least you know hooking up you know some kind of, of you know comm links or frequency uh, communications between the rebels on the ground and the pilots in the air, so that you know even though we're denying it you know right now we'd have a coherent close air support. Um, you know when, you know and when you you know Rob look at this debate uh, in Washington and in the blogosphere, you know what does do, do you do you kind of come back to your to your old post, you know, what, what, are you, what are you thinking from that perspective? Um, not necessarily beyond the need to have thought through, and I think the failure in this case to have thought through, um, exactly the end state we're trying to produce in Libya. And, and what I mean by that is the type of government and the type of state that we're trying, we, we would like to see in Libya. Um, because, I mean, in this campaign, I, I don't think we have that. Um, but if we had a better understanding of what kind of state we would want in Libya, then I think we would be able to work from that point um, and be able to mm -hmm. figure out maybe more aggressive. I, some poster in my blog, and uh, I can't remember his name right now, but he made, um, and he was a left-wing anti-interventionist, but I mean, he made the argument, wouldn't it be awesome, and I think he was being serious, wouldn't it be awesome if revolutionary armies from Tunisia and Egypt just solve this problem for us, right? I mean, if we were really thinking about a revolution like the French Revolution or something along those lines, which is a genuine progressive movement, um, or, I mean, let's assume that this is a genuine progressive movement, then actually violence in, 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 in pursuit of this genuine progressive movement that leftists and progressives could get behind would actually make a lot of sense. Um, and we would be able to think through the operational and tactical details. But at this point, you know, again, it comes back to the strategic incoherence that we're not even really sure um, which of the rebels we want to be in charge or, or the kind of state that we want the rebels to produce. Um, because that would suggest to us, well, we should be supporting this faction rather than this faction. And, and it would allow us, I mean, the responsibility to protect is very neutral, right? It's neutral as to yeah. actual ends. Um, and it's neutral as to who's being supported, who's being killed, and so forth. Which um, is why it's so problematic as a military doctrine. Right. You, can, right. you know, as, as, an, as an ideological commitment, it's, I think, from a progressive perspective, extremely easy to embrace for, for all right. of the familiar reasons. When you're talking about it in, you know, in, to, to borrow a military term kind of badly, uh, denied areas, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, the you know the the the, the somewhat uh, strong regime of Muammar Gaddafi, um, you you come across a real weakness in that in that very agnosticism. If the responsibility to protect you know had some kind of clearer implication as a democratic statement, or at right. least as, as an inclusive or representative statement, then then right. this would probably be a lot easier for the reasons that you that you discuss. But if you've got Essentially, an idea that says killing people is bad, turning a military campaign toward those ends, you know, sort of sows the seeds of incoherence. Unless, right. as you say, 
you are to set up a partition. Right. 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 And right. Well, how about we how about we how about we bounce off of Libya now and yeah. talk talk. Of, I don't know. You want to talk about Bahrain or Syria? We we didn't really plan it out, but uh, I mean, which which is sort of a more more to your more to your taste right now? Um, well, I, I I would kind of want to do you know Bahrain and Yemen together. You know, Syria. Okay. Uh, and, and let me let me sort of spin this out. Why? And, you know, you mm -hmm. can you can object to this, and we can we can move on. If you want to do Syria, I'm happy to talk mm -hmm. about that as well. But you know, I was I was having a conversation with uh, with my boss the other day uh, mm -hmm. about. Uh, the, the validity of, of some of the different arguments uh, for intervention in, in Yemen and, and, and I'm sorry in, uh, in in Libya and you know a point he made was and this is you know Noah Shackman the editor of Why Is Excellent right. Danger Room blog and and, uh, and and a wonderful magazine writer as well you should read uh, his new piece uh, in, about uh, the FBI anthrax uh, investigation in our new uh, April uh, 2011 issue um, and you know Noah made the point well you know take it from the perspective of of the uh, of the of the Libyan of, of, of the Middle East revolutions sort of dying if they die in Libya, and yeah. you know I, I wonder from the perspective, uh, you know along those lines, and I'm, you know I'm, I'm I I don't know enough to say whether you know that that's a you know a, a plausible circumstance that you know Gaddafi putting down uh, Libya would uh, the Libyan revolution would, would would serve to depress the spirits of everyone else, but you know I it, it would definitely strike me that. Revolutions that are looking to, you know, some kind of statement of support from the U.S. would, would find a lot more to be pissed off about uh, in Bahrain and Yemen, where you have governments that are, if they're not, you know, exactly proxies, you know, there's something extremely close. And the United States does nothing to, to, to stop the violence uh, that's been ongoing for several days. That strikes me as as far more galling than uh, a circumstance like like Libya in the abstract, where the United States really has very few strategic right. interests and very little involvement. You know, we, we own what happens in, 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 in a rather similar way that we do, that we did with Mubarak, uh, given, given 30 years worth of ties and, you know, a, a billion three, a billion point three, uh, you know, dollars every year. Um, what happens in the country that hosts uh, the Navy's fifth fleet, in the country that's increasingly uh, indistinct from the United States when it comes to counterterrorism against right. the U.S.'s number one target that isn't in Pakistan. And, and you know, I, 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 would, I would find it uh, far more alarming from, from that perspective that, you know, the, the U.S. inaction uh, in Bahrain and, Ye and Yemen is, is so acute to the point where, you had Bob Gates saying, I think on either Wednesday or Thursday, that we're, you know, when it comes to Yemen, we're not doing any thinking. You know, there's no plan B beyond uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, and you had, you know, nearly two months worth of assurances from mm -hmm. Gates and from from Admiral Mullen that uh, the Khalifa family in, in, in Bahrain is, is totally willing uh, to reform, and instead we've seen some of the most gruesome YouTube videos of the right. entire Middle East uprising of, 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 of those guys splitting the heads open of Shiites. Right. I, I guess, do you, do you, so, so, so is the premise here that um, if we're really thinking about the long term, or the, the end when we say long term, <laughs> the, the short and medium term success of this um, string of revolutions that are the, that we're calling the Arab Spring, then if we really want to, if we really want to, Dampen that spirit, then we then 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 we would we would be saying nothing to Bahrain. So it's more important. It's it's worse that we're saying nothing to Bahrain and Yemen than it would be if we did nothing with Libya. Is that is that how I, I can boil down your argument? Yeah, I think I would make that contention. But okay. you know, in circumstances where the United States really has demonstrated interest, and mm -hmm. we at, we elect not to do that, not 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 to involve ourselves. That's worse than. A circumstance in which we would elect to do nothing. You see, I mean, uh, I, even, I, yeah. well, I, I guess I find it intriguing because I suspect that it would. I suspect that the U.S. reticence in Bahrain and Yemen will, it won't so much change whether certain revolutions happen or not, but they will change the content of those revolutions. And in particular, mm -hmm. 
if revolutions happen in Bahrain and Yemen, the tacit and in some cases explicit support of the U.S. for the regime is likely just to turn the revolutions in, in much more hostile directions to the United States than it is to actually dampen the revolutions themselves. So right. the, fer the fervor is going to be there. It's right. a question, it, 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 it forces, if I understand you correctly, mm -hmm. uh, both the U.S. and the revolutionaries into this, you know, vicious cycle where the U.S., because it fears, you know, the, the, the anti, you know, growing anti-American anger on the streets uh, to, you know, side more closely uh, with, with the regime's odiousness, which, in, which allows the regime's uh, a greater deal of repression, which fuels the anger of the protesters and, and their desires to, to separate themselves from the United States and so on. Mm -hmm. Right, right. No, exactly. There's a kind of... So, fuck! fuck! <laughs> you know, what, what in the fuck? Right, right, and and it's an increasing it's an increasing problem, and I guess that um, but yeah, I mean, I I I don't know, I guess how either how to assess the first argument, which has been made by a lot of people, in which you kind of voice there without really supporting, which is that not supporting the Libyan rebels would have meant the end of the Arab Spring, um, because it would have indicated that. Uh, it would have indicated people like uh, Bashar al-Assad and other people around that you just needed to be violent enough and that everything was going to going to turn down. So, I mean, I guess right. it's real. I'm, I, I'm, you should see my tournament bracket right now because I've already lost three of my final four. So I'm really horrible at making predictions, um, obviously. So I guess it's hard for me to predict whether a Libyan rebel overthrow eventually of Gaddafi is going to have any sort of domino effect now on any of the neighboring states. Um, or or whether the successful repression by Gaddafi would have had any sort of domino. I mean, I guess to think about it this way, and this, the timing is a little bit different, but how much would it have mattered for um, Eastern European democracy in the long term if Ceausescu had been successful in terms of repressing the Romanian uh, revolution? Um, would you have just had another Belarus? I mean, basically, would you just have had another Belarus, just slightly farther west, that wouldn't right. have made that much difference in the politics of the rest of Eastern Europe? Or was this something that was really important in terms of um, consol consolidating the gains of uh, the 1989 revolutions? I mean, I, I don't think any of us can really, you know, judge from, from you know, here right. in the United States, but uh, I, I wonder if Libya isn't more compartmentalized. Um, or that the pace of, of the communications and the spread of, of, this, of this fervor and this moment of possibility uh, doesn't just have a life of its own to the point where if you're you know, primarily pissed off about uh, circumstances in the country in which you live and in the, the areas that, that surround you, um, and you've just seen some really remarkable advances uh, in Tunisia and, and especially in Egypt, you know, can't you just write off Libya, or are you just not going to be discouraged? I, I wonder if there's, you know, some sociological research on that, or some political science research on it. Right. Um, and, you know, it, it, it would just, you know, strike me as, as, as intuitively plausible that, you know, like, you know, most of us, we tend to, uh, you know, find reinforcement in, in beliefs we already hold and, and, and mm -hmm. explain away refutations of those beliefs that, that you know, setbacks in places like Libya wouldn't, you know, we, we just fall into that pattern as well. Um, you know, at least until, you know, there's a revolution in Saudi Arabia and the Saudis brutally suppress it and the entire world goes along with it. Right, right. I, I, I guess thinking about it in terms of hopefully bringing back to, to Syria in kind of a, in a productive kind of hypothetical way, um, if, if we'd done nothing and, and they cut off and to Benghazi and butchered a bunch of people. Um, and then you did have, and there, in fact, there are some people who argue that, that all this attention on Libya is taking so much attention away from the, the Syrian demonstrations that they're actually yeah. potentially losing steam because of there's no media attention to Syria. Um, but say you're then a Syrian general and there are Syrian demonstrations and you have to ask yourself, um, am I going to be like Libya or am I going to be like Egypt? Um, I mean, just the fact of having a cautionary tale of Libya yeah. there um, might provide a different set of incentives. I guess it, it's so complicated. All these things are so complicated in terms of working out what the... I guess this well, is well, how this I is where... Think. Yeah, go on. Uh, all of this is so complicated and so difficult to predict that anyone who says that this action will have X effect is almost certainly lying or an idiot. 
Um, and so we, we need to have some skepticism about the claims that they're making, right, and sort of really loud, yeah. dangerous warning sign claims. And we can compartmentalize, or at least just, dist- let's, let's put it, we can at least distinguish that uh, there, are, there are some, you know, there are some audiences for which this has to be uh, more salient, the, the, you know, the Libya, Egypt example, and that's, that's the, 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 the region's militaries. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where, if, if, you know, if you were trying to come up with an American, you know, grand strategy uh, towards these uh, revolutions, it might make more sense to be, you know, a kind of well-wisher to the revolutions to, you know, find a way of, 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 of figuring out that you'll, you'll side with whomever, uh, mm-hmm. you know, comes out on top within them on the perspective that, you know, you can probably do business with most of them. Um, and you really target your messaging and your, your quiet outreach to the region's militaries, and you talk, you know, Turkey about what you could really actually provide, uh, how problematic it will be uh, for them to survive uh, if they do end up taking measures to, to suppress their populations, and that should they, you know, find themselves uh, in a position of, of, of not going along with the more draconian features of of the security apparatuses in these areas, then the United States really can do business with you uh, right. long term and, and find a way to make it uh, worth your while. Um, because you know, if, if really what we're talking about uh, is is you know citing the United States on the side of an end of regional repression, then it only makes sense to look at the security apparatus and say, like, if you guys want to demonstrate great do your thing, um, you know, we're we're you know not really going to you know, do much more for you. You know, you, you, you get it how you live. But when it comes to the people who can murder you, uh, we're, we're going to, you know, talk to them quite a lot in order to dissuade them from doing that. And if that means uh, there's a secondary effect on 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 what uh, regional leaders will, will have as their relationship both with, with the United States and with you, that's probably all to the better because they won't have the power to negatively impact our interests and they won't have the power to kill their civilians if we basically uh, find new relationships with the security apparatus. But maybe that's not possible. You know, I, right. and, and, yeah. and, and the United States doesn't have, you know, a good track record, um, as, as great a track record as we have of working with regional militaries, of, of finding ways of saying, you know, we are better for you uh, than your regime's stuff. Right. I mean, I guess um, I had sort of hoped. I had hoped, sort of hoped that U.S. policy was um, motivated by the broad lines that you just described. Um, until we went to war with Libya. Um, right. In which case, it became clear that even if that those conceptions had been motivating the U.S. policy, um, that they were abandoned in the hopes of rescuing the, the Libyan revolution. Um, and it'll be sort of an interesting thing about when we wonder, even if we manage to save the Libyan revolution, um, even if we manage, all we manage to do is achieve a partition and we have two Libyas. You know, maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but wonder for a long time if that had a positive or a negative effect on what else was going on in the world, well, what I, else was going on in the region. Well, here's the thing. Would it, would it actually be really terrible if there was two Libyas? Because, you know, neither side will be satisfied with just half a Libya. Oh, I mean, so, I mean, what implication do you draw from that? That you would, you would essentially guarantee a Western-backed, you know, rather, you know, fairly literally balkanized situation mm-hmm. in which, you know, you, you just have a recipe for, for, for a protracted civil war that, that, draws in a Western security commitment. You know, I don't, I don't see how, I can see how the responsibility to protect might want to stop with, with a partition. I can't see how the actual political circumstances and that military fortunes will. Right, right, right. I mean, I, I, wants I, the whole country. The, the rebels want the whole country, you know, <laughs> and, and particularly if, you know, you know, take your, take your, your, your Miserata hypothetical, you know, if there is an East Libya and a West Libya, and East Libya sees its allies in, Mid- in Miserata start to be brutally slaughtered. That's all the more reason to try and push the boundary westward and march on triple. Right. With right, right. Know, American, and, French, and British forces essentially at that point leading the way. But if I was a and, private security comp- if I was a private security company right now, my God, would I be drawing up bills in particular? I'd be finding yeah. out every excuse I can to go to Benghazi and just offer my services. 
Are there are, are there any publicly listed? Because I have a little money to invest, you know, in a very simple way. Um, yeah, I mean, it, again, it, it's hard, even with a partition, it is hard to imagine the coalition being able, as you suggest, to sufficiently constrain um, the whatever leadership there exists for the Libyan rebel movement um, from pursuing the ends that it wants to pursue. And especially since, I mean, as I understand it, the Libyan or the, the rebels actually do have control over over some elements of the in, the oil infrastructure, and so it might actually have bright long term economic prospects. Um, and so, I mean, what you might see long term is some sort of rearmament program and uh, the effort towards pushing towards a, a Libyan civil war part two, if it if it ever even dies down. Um, I mean, just the history of partition. Right so, yeah, I mean, just the history of partition is such an awful one. You know, it, you know, constant conflict, you know, emerges so that you know when when you think much like the idea of of you know a limited military campaign, like the presumption of what it is we're doing now, you, you, it just it just doesn't play out that way typically. Right, but even even in situations where um, it's really obvious that both sides don't want just to live together, where they want to have two different countries, like in, I mean, and it has worked out a few sometimes well in in Europe. But what about Eritrea and Ethiopia? I mean, that would seem right. to have been a, a a wonderful template for a peaceful um, peaceful uh, divorce between two countries that didn't want to be part of the same country, um, and it has turned into a series of bloody wars. Right, I mean over. For reasons that are, you know, difficult to understand, right? I mean, very small territorial reasons and so forth. All right. On that, um, I think I have to cut us a bit short this afternoon. Sure. All right. Well, thanks, Rob. This has been great. Yeah, um, it's been fantastic. And and uh, we'll have to, to, you know, next time do this over. Oh. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, thank All you right, much, thank Spencer. You. Thank you, and bye -bye. thank you to everyone who watched. Bye. -bye.